Hello, my name is Wade Namura, and this is Rotary Serving Our Community. With us today, we have uh, two special guests. Uh, we have Megan Burney from Unite to Light and Art Fisher, who is a member of uh, Rotary. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having Good us. You. Let's see, uh, Megan, we're going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So uh, I'm president of Unite to Light, and we believe that access to clean and affordable and safe energy is really the key out of poverty for, for everybody in the world. Um, I've been with Unite to Light for about a year and a half. Uh, absolutely love the, the product which we, which we have here today. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's a pretty simple, a simple thing that we're offering to, to people and we really focus on three areas, education, midwives and health clinics, and then disaster response. Great. So tell us a little bit about your background on how you got involved with United Light and if your career fit this, this track. <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I, my first job out of grad school is working for the Community Environmental Council here in Santa Barbara. Okay. Uh, for people who aren't familiar, they're the ones who host Earth Day. They're okay. the ones who started recycling. Yeah. Um, so they've got a long history here in Santa Barbara, and I ran the energy efficiency and renewable energy programs for about six years there. Right. So the, the solar aspect started there. Um, and then I went and worked for a, a for-profit startup that did commercial solar finance. So still staying in the, in the solar field. Um, but I knew Claude Doré, who was the original co-founder and, and president of Unite to Light. He and I had met each other um, at a talk. We actually tell the same story. We're not sure if I saw him speak or he saw me speak, but <laughs> one of us invited the other one to come to another event, and, and we became friends after that. Um, and Unite to Light was looking for a new president and, and he gave me a call and asked if I'd be interested. Um, and I was excited to get back into the nonprofit field. I love, I love helping others, uh, but I also like that this is a, a product. So it's a little bit of a different nonprofit. We have a little bit of a different business model than a lot of nonprofits do. Um, so that's how I, I got involved with Unite to Light. <laughs> Very good, thank you. And how about you, Art? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a retired educator. I taught general science for many years and then uh, principal superintendent at the county office. I did a service learning grant program throughout the county of uh, Santa Barbara. And that's where you attach service to the learning and uh, the kids learn their math and language arts while they're doing a project. Uh, I joined Carpentry and Morning Rotary in uh, 2010 Shortly after that, I heard Claude Ray speak. <laughs> and with my science background in ecology, I thought, this is a product that I'm interested in. And uh, so I talked to Claude and Unite to Light staff and became a liaison from Rotary to uh, Unite to Light and promoted the projects at conferences uh, locally, nationally, and uh, internationally. Very good, very good. And. Uh, the fascination to, to the lights, was that something that you were looking for as a Rotarian, or was this something that just happened along? It was a complete surprise. The uh, presentation was one of the programs. We have a program every week, and it, uh, it just tickled me. I was fascinated by the academic value of the lights for people without electricity, a billion and a half people in the world. That fascinated me. The concept itself with... Uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners creating the LED white light, never replace it, uh, always brilliant, uh, the rechargeable AA battery and the high tech, all for four ounces. So <laughs> I thought that was just great and how can I promote this? And I was lucky because the Goleta Noontime Club was doing a grant as a lead, a global grant, uh, a big one, $50,000. And I became a co-writer and a co-presenter, and we got 17, 1,700 lights included hmm. in a grant that serviced an orphanage and seven schools. Wow, very good. Let's, uh, since we're talking about the light, and audience actually can't see it as close as we can. Would you like to go over the features of the light itself? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so Art mentioned this, it's, it's four ounces. Um, one of the key features is it's lightweight because we need to ship these all over the world. We've currently shipped to 70 different countries. It fits in this lovely little box. So again, the, the shipping and transportation, when you're trying to move thousands of these over the world, it's really important to be, to be small and lightweight. So that was, that was one of the first things to, to look at. Uh, there's a half watt solar panel. There's a 20 lumen LED light bulb. And, and that really is 
made for, you probably can't see it too brightly, but it's really made for reading. That was the original intent of the light, which is also why we have the gooseneck, so that you can get a very specific task light. Uh, we've also found that with uh, healthcare, so uh, midwives, doctors, nurses, um, the gooseneck's really important as well because you can, again, get that really targeted task lighting that you need in those, in those places. Uh, we have a single AA battery. This is rechargeable, I should say. This is the same battery that you and I can get uh, pretty much any hardware store, okay. um, but it is the, the rechargeable kind. Um, it is a water-resistant feature as well, and then... See, I guess the other, the other fun thing with the gooseneck is that it makes it a hands-free device. Uh, we kind of joke about this, but it actually, a lot of people do use our light this way. Midwives, um, also, you know, young girls who are carrying water to and from their, their village to their home. Um, this allows them to use both hands. Basically become hands-free there. Hands-free device. It's well, low, low-tech version of hands-free, <laughs> but when you don't have anything else, it works really, really well. Um, Great. Great. Yeah, anything I missed? I'd like to add that the... Uh, some of the schools that get these lights for their students will hang the lights during the day on a clothesline. So you'll see 30 lights on a clothesline. They charge during the day. It's very convenient. And then uh, the students have the light at night for their studies. Just another feature. Very, very uh, good. The, uh, the light is good. You mentioned emergencies and disasters. It's, it's so flexible in its use and placement and the task lighting. That, mm -hmm. That's very, very important. We, discovered that in Mexico, the ladies who embroider, instead of using a kerosene lamp, if they use this light, it's just much more efficient and better for their health than their eyes. Yeah. I guess one other thing uh, to mention is that on a full charge, you get eight hours of night light. Uh, every day you leave it out, you get about four hours of night light. And we found that that's a pretty good number for most people. They, about four extra hours of night light is really the... Yeah. The key amount to need, um, and for for you and I, we can just put these in the in the windowsill, and it's always ready. So when we had all sure. of those power outages, I a was nice just feature. Say that it was a great feature. I actually, used mine a few times when we had all the power outages from the fires and the floods. Absolutely, I, I remember sitting like sitting on my kitchen table with the newspaper out at you know, nine o'clock at night reading. I believe this one also has a feature of the uh, hole in the bottom that uh, for hanging uh, yeah. a nail hole. You're so. right. There is a, a nail hole in the bottom. So the idea is if somebody wants to hang it on their wall so it can be more of a, a room light, it, it can do that. Um, and the neck is very flexible and, and stiff at the same time. So you can you can kind of point it where you want it to go. Very good. I'd like to add there's one more thing that uh, people are attracted to, Rotarians, especially when they're looking for service projects. This has uh, an economic justice f feature to it. If you use kerosene, it's about 8 to $10 a month, sometimes more in countries like Africa. And uh, we calculated over a two-year period of time, this is about $0.08 cents a month. Hmm. So people making couple dollars a day, that's very significant savings for families. So there's an economic component, economic justice component. Very true. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, you brought some pictures along with you, so why don't we jump into these pictures because it's kind of interesting to see all the places in the world these lights are going. So we'll start with the first picture. Uh, Art, is that your picture that Yes, this, uh, this was a project that I got a call from the E-Club of One World, and they had uh, passed the hat digitally and had some money to spend for lighting. This is one of their projects that they supplied the lights for. Uh, it's uh, out of Nepal and these are folks in the Himalayas and they take, they have sunlight and uh, the light just, just fit their purpose and they sent pictures back. With every grant that we uh, issue, we try and have photos back and they must have had a really good photographer. <laughs> they've captured a water buffalo and uh, their houses. Picture and, there, yeah, picture there with the water buffalo. And also. they uh, included rotary, which was nice. We also had a project that we did um, probably six years ago, maybe longer than that, in Nepal itself. Because of the fact that the mountains are so high, they couldn't get power up there. So. Mm -hmm. um, there were issues with libraries, with um, textbooks, and all of the above. So we did send up a few lights at that time, but it's good mm -hmm. to see it continuing on. You mentioned libraries. Uh, one service club, the Noontime uh, Club in Carpinteria, uh, established libraries in Panama. But the villages didn't have electricity. So they paired a book with a light, and they checked out a book and a light together uh, to take home. 
So that was a surprise. That's one of my favorite projects I had never thought of before I started at Unite to Light were these light libraries. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Art mentioned one, but we have many that we've done in South Africa. We've actually kind of really started doing that only in these communities we work with is that the schools essentially become responsible for the lights and the children can check them out when they need them if it's test time if there's certain homework due um, in South Africa at the end of the year they have to pass what's, or at the end of their school terms they have to pass what's called a metrics exam and towards the last two months of school the students essentially move into the school so they can study uh, even though the schools don't have electricity they have more candles than the homes usually do so these okay. lights become this these light libraries at these schools and we've actually seen an increase of graduation rates of 30 percent wow with just just changing the lights yeah so that's been another fun um, project and it's something that's long-standing and sustainable right because the lights stay at the schools the batteries should last about 700 cycles, which is two or three years, depending on how often you use them. But it's much easier to, if the school has it, just replace the batteries right. than if it's out in the individual's homes. Um, so it's been a really great project for us, these, these li libraries all over the world. Very good. <laughs> it's a great idea. We have uh, next pictures. Um, you went through the first three. These are all of Nepal. And uh, the next set of pictures. Art, is that yeah, something? Yeah, I can speak to uh, the next three. Uh, okay. The picture you're looking at now uh, is the passing out of solar lights in Ghana at St. Augustine's okay. Technical High School. And it turns out the fellow on the left is Mark Malanco, and he lives in Santa Maria, California, but he has relatives in uh, a native, his native uh, village in uh, Ghana. And uh, we uh, provided through a grant lights to him, and so far he's taken over 200 lights to this school in Ghana, and they have unreliable electricity. And uh, the kids love them, he loves them. We love the project because he actually takes the lights uh, with his wife uh, on an airplane, and then in a train, and then in a truck to get to this, wow. this remote village in the uh, northwest part of Ghana. Outstanding. And, and uh, the shirt that I am wearing in the next picture is from Mark. He it was a thank you gift, and he's talking to a prof professor from Ohio. And we were at a uh, conference on uh, poverty and sustainable projects. This professor was a speaker, but he actually grew up with a kerosene lamp that he's holding, a model of a kerosene lamp. And he was just fascinated by the Unite to Light project. And uh, the, uh, he, we, we hooked up and have exchanged information since then. Good, hope you exchanged lights also. Definitely. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> okay. The last project I'd like to thank Wade for, uh, we're actually in a classroom outside of Morelia, about an hour and a half from the city of Morelia in Mexico, near cent in central Mexico. And the teacher of this class is the daughter of a Rotarian in the city of uh, Morelia. And so we drove an hour and a half, uh, and the students that you see in this picture live in houses in a rural, outside a rural village with no electricity and uh, no uh, water, uh, running water. So each of the students received a Unite to Light light and uh, that helps them with their, uh, their academic skills. And one of the students actually comes to school on a donkey. <laughs> so, that was a fascinating project, and I understand you're going to do an African safari, I mean a uh, Mexican safari. We are, uh, coming up. Uh, it, it'll be done usually in the spring, late spring, so, mm -hmm. so we do have one coming up in April. And Rotarians are invited to that. For sure. Yep. Rotarians and non-Rotarians, all-inclusive. The next uh, few pictures are some of the collections I've made over the years because um, I've had the opportunity also to ex uh, put some of these lights out. The first picture I have is a small village, very small village in a, an area of the city is where the community is called Guangoche. And in Guangoche, there's about 120 people. Some of the uh, living conditions, there are people actually living in caves up there. So it's very, uh, very primitive, no power, barely have enough water to even survive up there. But we did get them the lights. Their school is the building behind that you can see there. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, it had a holy roof to it. The books were mostly damaged because of water damage, but it was a, a project there where they appreciated the lights and they were able to take them home. 
The next picture is also of the same village, the village of Guangoche. And the inside of it is what I wanted to present because they are one of the areas where they do inside cooking, stoves, fire, light, everything is all done by wood fire. And uh, they didn't have chimneys at that time. You see this one here, but it just came straight, literally, up into the roof or to the ceiling. So you see all the darkness on that one. That literally is all carbon buildup. So you can imagine how the poor people are living in those kind of conditions. One of the uh, partnerships that has worked out well with Rotary is that in Rotary, different clubs from different areas will pick up these projects. And so this picture here is um, a team uh, of Rotarians. They are from Zamora, and they actually started a project. They took 100 of our lights, and they're going to be distributing them also in, in the area of Mexico, central Mexico. The question probably the audience wants to hear, because most of them are Rotarians, do we know about how many lights have actually gone out in Rotary projects? Uh, we think it's about 12,000. Wow. Yeah, so we've distributed about 95,000 total, and total about 12,000 of those are from Rotary projects. And uh, some of them are big ones in the thousands, and some of them are small ones in the hundreds, and even okay. in the tens and twenties. But um, yeah, we've had a, quite a few projects with Rotary over there. It's definitely one of our biggest supporters. Sounds good. Um, all right, you're kind of uh, involved with distributing these, aren't you? Yes, yeah, so we have an incentive program. Uh, our club, the Carpentry and Morning Club, uh, sells the lights on a BOGO basis, which is we're at a festival like the Avocado Festival or a Fourth of July Festival, and, and uh, a person can buy one light, and uh, we will give a light to a family in need. And so with that program, we are offering to other Rotary clubs uh, in the Western United States, uh, if they purchase 25 lights, our club will donate 25 lights so we can put together international grants of 50 lights and that is a stimulus for other ro rotary clubs around our region to participate in international projects using unite to light very good yeah so maybe you can just kind of expand a little bit more on that because i get a lot of questions um so we sell the lights to nonprofits or rotary organizations at ten dollars a light it's essentially our cost um, and those are intended to go to people who don't have electricity. If you want to buy one, I'm going to charge you double. I'm going to charge you 20 <laughs> bucks, but I'm going to give one away at the same time. And that's what Art was talking about in the buy one, give one projects. Got it. So Rotary clubs can kind of play into that in a couple ways. One is if they just want to buy 25 lights for a project they have, they can pay $250. They can match it with Art's project, uh, 25 matching. And so now they're getting 50 lights for $250. It's $5 a light. It's an amazing deal. They could also sell lights themselves, kind of like Art does. So if they wanted to do more than 25 lights, they could also go to their friends and family and, and sell lights, and we would let them de uh, dedicate where those lights would go for their own projects. Okay. Um, okay. So it's a cool way to, to raise funds. It's kind of like selling Girl Scout cookies, but <laughs> with electricity. <laughs> with electricity. <laughs> yeah. Very good. We have a few more photos here. So the next picture is, um, who wants to go over that one? Do you guys know what that, that one was for? Uh, this is uh, the school in Ghana, okay. and it's, uh, this was another year, a different year of distributions. And uh, it's, it's, we have a similar situation in Zimbabwe, and the interesting thing with Zimbabwe is um, uh, the grant that we uh, sponsored was 100 lights. We had a flower grower in Carpentria that volunteered free transportation to Tennessee. And the school had a, a, an alumni, alumnus in Tennessee, and they regularly put items in barrels for the school in Zimbabwe, put the lights in with shirts and so on, put it on a boat for three months, safe passage to Zimbabwe. And then the school receives it with the local Rotary Club in Zimbabwe. So security, tariffs, customs, they're all part of shipping lights to people in need, as uh, Megan Megan knows and deals with regularly, and so we help Rot Rotarians do that without having to pay extra tariffs and extra customs. Wow. Yeah, and, and that's one of the values of working with Rotary, especially on these projects that are 100 or 200 lights, because you can, you can carry 100 lights in a suitcase. It's, it's not a big, it's that's not true. a big suitcase. It's four a bigger ounces, suitcase. Four but ounces each, just volume, but yeah. not weight. Yeah, and, and sure. since we're not selling them, they don't, they'll usually get, um, 
cleared for duties and customs. So if you're hand carrying them, you're on a plane, uh, they'll usually clear you for duties and customs, and that's how we get a lot of these lights into the hands of the people who really need them. It's by people traveling to those places. Um, and then there's a lot of value in that as well because you have that personal connection, you get that experience. Uh, and I think that's part of the beauty of these lights is that you do have that one-on-one -on -one connection and, and you can see somebody whose life is actually changing because of a, a fairly simple thing that we consider, something we consider fairly, fairly simple. But, uh, but really to the individual that's, that's getting this, it's, it can be life-changing, um, which is it's a great great thing for people to be able to do. It is uh, very good. Um, the picture before that, the uh, project in Zamora, we took uh, 100 lights. I actually put that in a cardboard box, <laughs> wrapped it up with a piece of twine, and it worked out well. If you've gone to developing countries, that's kind of the standard luggage that you'll see on the, on the line, so it worked out well. I do carry a certificate um, that shows that it's going to a rotary project, and that usually has been plenty good enough. Yeah, yeah, and we supply that to anybody who oh, purchases lights through us. We'll basically, when you purchase the lights, we'll include a, a duty and custom request form. It's it's up to the agent, the border agent, whether or not they're going to charge you duties and customs. But if you have a, a letter, we've we haven't yet had problems with it. Right. Um, and you can also ask the airline for um, oh, what's it called, uh, humanitarian oh, right. baggage. Right. 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 And again, it's up to the airline. But we've had a lot of success when you have an extra baggage saying, hey, this is for humanitarian aid can you waive my extra baggage fee? And, and usually they do. They're mm. usually pretty good about it. So well, um, again, same type of thing. You have the letter, it's stamped and signed. And, right, um, right. So we make sure that anybody who orders lights has those letters so that they can present them and, and hopefully reduce their costs. Perfect. Very good. Next picture, uh, I believe that picture was one that I, was, uh, I worked with. That is uh, for lamp distribution in the country of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And we actually were approached by um, Mitsubishi Chemical to do Project there a grant because they wanted to get involved in Bangladesh, had no connections there. So they asked who could do the work, and I said, well, Rhoda could be there, and we could do that. I had connections in Bangladesh, so we actually distributed a thousand lights the first time in a grant, just a grant from, uh, from uh, Mitsubishi Chemical. It worked out so well that they called us back, said, let's do another thousand. So within a year's time, we actually did 2,000 lights with them, well. funding the amount. So it was great. The last picture I have here is a picture of uh, past international president, Ron Burton. And the picture we have with him giving the lights out to students, they're all inner city students from Chicago. And mm -hmm. they found out that as an incentive by giving the lights out that they would spend more time reading in the evening using the lights. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was pretty fascinating. All of the presidents, by the way, do have the lights on their desk. So we made sure we covered that part of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's worked out well. <laughs> We have a little bit more time, so what I'd like to maybe go over is some of the future. What's going to happen with uh, the Unite to Light? Do we, are we looking at developing it to something larger, bigger, than any other models, I would say? Sure. So, um, you know, we've really focused historically on the neediest of the needy, you know, people who can't afford even a low-cost solar light. So I mentioned before, you know, children learning to read, midwives and health clinics and, and disaster response. And uh, about a year ago, we really tailored our efforts to, mm. to focus on those needs. And so we're going to continue to do that. We have our own project partners that we're actually going out and, and raising lights for. Um, so that's going to continue. We do have some small adjustments coming on the technology. The, this is our what we call our Luke light. It's our, our reading light. You're going to see a couple changes towards the end of the year, um, just making it even sturdier, even better. Um, and we're also developing a solar charger. So we've historically had a solar charger. Um, I thought it could be better, to be honest. And the design was basically this, but a little bit bigger. And it, it just really wasn't what I thought our, and I had been hearing feedback from our constituents that they needed. So they wanted something that maybe lit the room, that charged a cell phone. Um, and this is more targeted for kind of people working in nonprofits, uh, people who are maybe owning a business, uh, entrepreneurs in, in these developing nations, and then also disaster response and emergency preparedness here in the US. So we're completely scratching the old design and going from the, from the ground up to design a new solar powered charger that really meets the needs of people in developing nations and, and even people here in the, in the US. Um, that's again, highly durable. Uh, charges your cell phone and is a price point that people can can really afford in these nations. Very good. 
Now, with the, uh, the lights that are being distributed, I guess uh, Unite to Light's primary objective is to get as many lights out there as possible. So uh, are you partnering with anybody besides Rotary? Are there other groups and organizations out there you're working with? Yeah, we're a, we're a pretty small team, so our partnerships are our lifeblood. Um, a couple of exciting ones this year. One of them, Direct Relief. A okay. lot of people here in, in yeah. uh, Santa Barbara know Direct Relief. Mm -hmm. um, they're our primary distributor for di disaster response. When a disaster happens, I call them. I say, how many lights do you need? They tell me. I get them as many as I can, and then we'll actually fundraise after the fact. Um, we're going to try to put some in what they call their disaster hold this year. So we'll basically just give them a thousand lights and whenever a disaster happens, they'll pull from them and then we'll, we'll, we'll fa raise funds for those after. Um, they've also purchased our lights from us and put them in their new hygiene kits, which they're distributing when good, disasters yeah. happen. Um, another exciting partnership we had this year was with the United Nations Population Fund in Bangladesh. Uh, so we've been working with them and the Bangladesh Midwifery Society for the, for the year to, to raise lights to send to them. And then uh, when the Rohingya refugee crisis happened, they actually called us. Mm -hmm. And so with a, a mixture of purchase and donation, we sent about 10,000 lights to Bangladesh this year for the Rohingya refugees and the Bangladesh Midwifery Society. Um, but those are just two examples of, of larger organizations. Um, Churches, synagogues are another very important partner of us. All the religious sure. organizations, they do something similar that Rotary does. They'll maybe buy 100 or 200 lights and take them to their own, own project partners. Um, but we really love working with kind of the big organizations all the way down to the individuals. Um, it's funny when you mentioned Nepal, I think that's probably the most frequently visited place by individuals. So we regularly have people come and say, hey, I just graduated from college. I'm going to go trekking in Nepal. Can I buy 10 lights from you? Absolutely. Here you go. Take them. Give them away. Um, we get a we get a lot of those calls. So partners um, are important for their feet on the ground, and because uh, we really um, want to trust them, and we do trust them to to put the lights where they need to go. So it sounds like lights are not used just specifically for education, but also for times of need, disaster times where you actually just need a light, or even for medical. Uh, which is outstanding. Yeah. There's one story I heard from a gentleman that was involved with this, a Rotarian, he's a doctor, training midwives. And he said this became invaluable. With this and the training that they were able to um, give to the midwives, they went from 25% uh, fatality cases to actually zero within the first year yeah. of, of using these lights. So yeah, I think that was the Nomad Foundation out of Ohio. It and was the Nomad Foundation, yep. Dr. Bob Skanky. Yeah, and they regularly call us still and uh, take lights with them when they good, when they good. travel, and uh, yeah, it's it's stories like that that really keep us kind of kind of going in, in this organization. And um, well, what I'd like to do is actually we're a little bit out of time here. I'd like to thank both of you for coming and for doing the uh, the projects that you do. Um, Unite to Light is outstanding. It's going to make its way through, and we'll see it around the world. With it, everybody, take a look at Unite to Light. Now, these solar lights are great, even as a household use, because I found out during the disasters. I sure use them quite often. With that, thank you very much, and we will see you next time.